What I tell my students is, look, if you are a better person, that makes your family stronger. If your family is stronger, that makes your community stronger. If your community is stronger, then you are affecting people all over. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for episode 18 of Whistlekick and Martial Arts Radio, the only weekly podcast dedicated to bringing you amazing stories from traditional martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder here at Whistlekick, makers of the best sparring gear on earth, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about our products, like our sparring helmet that's far more comfortable than alternatives, at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a whole lot more, all for free, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've started adding something new to the show notes. For each movie that our guests recommend, we're checking both Netflix and Amazon Prime to see if they're available, and providing that information to you. It's a small thing, but for those of you that have an account on either of those services, it should be worthwhile. And while you're on our website, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter full of information, discounts, and useful martial arts content. And now for the review of the week. This is titled One of a Kind, and it's from LNG ENO. This is an awesome podcast. I have really enjoyed all the episodes and look forward to each new one. Its content is varied and inspiring. I started martial arts as an adult, and I do find it difficult sometimes being the only person in my classes that can legally drink, including the instructors most of the time. I'm also sure I consume much more Advil, but I do love it, and Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio is there every week to give a little boost of inspiration. In addition, I have discovered books, movies, and websites, the t-shirt one is my favorite, that have expanded my knowledge and enjoyment of martial arts. If I had to offer any criticism at all, I would say the interview questions are a little rigid. Everyone gets the same questions in the same order. It does lead to some very interesting discussions and side topics, but I personally like interviews that are a little more organic. Every podcast starts out a certain way, and most of all, with time as it grows into its own. I look forward to seeing this journey. Keep up the great work. Thank you for that review, and I personally appreciate the comments. We've gone back and forth about our questions, and what we've come back to each time is that they do work. So while I'm not saying that we're never going to change them, at least for now, based on the feedback that we've received from listeners, we are going to keep things the way they are. But criticism keeps us moving forward and working at our best, so we certainly do welcome that. And hopefully those of you out there listening, if you do have comments about the show, whether you leave them as a review or you email us or submit a contact uh, form on the web, we'd be open to that, please. It, it, we want this show to be the best that it can be. And the way to do that is to hear from you as to what you think. This week's episode is with Master Leonard Jordan. He's a Taekwondo practitioner from Vermont, and he and I go back quite a few years as I train with his dad. But I didn't bring him on because of that relationship. Even before I knew him well, I knew how unique a person he was. Master Jordan has this presence that just draws others in. He's an exceptional martial artist and instructor, and anyone that's witnessed him in class or in competition knows what I'm talking about. And that magnetic personality really comes through in this episode as he shares some incredible stories that really get quite personal at times. And with that... Master Jordan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Absolute honor to be here. Cool. Well, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I know you've got good stories. Absolutely. Looking forward to the stories. <laughs> well, what I don't really know is how you got started. I mean, I know sure. I've gotten bits and pieces because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, as it's, it's come up a little bit through there, I train with your dad. Absolutely. And we're not going to turn this into something yeah. about him and about me because yeah. this isn't about me, but I want you to fill in some of those pieces. How'd Sounds you, good. How'd well, you get going? I'll give you the whole uh, the whole genesis of it. Uh, back in 1982, uh, Grandmaster Bruce Twing actually opened a school in Randolph. And my whole entire family, we all started together back then. And for me, uh, you know, Taekwondo was just another thing to do. So I was into every sport I can get my hands on. Baseball, basketball, soccer. Soccer was my number one passion, you know. You know, tell you more about those stories after. Uh, but so it was something I just did here and there as I was uh, growing up and in between time of the sports. And then when I moved up to Johnson uh, in the uh, mid to late 80s is when I actually uh, continued my training with Grandmaster Dunleavy. And I've been with him forever. So basically, you know, I started in Randolph, but all of my training and knowledge really came from training with Grandmaster Dunleavy. Okay. So... How old were you when you got started? 82. Uh, let's see. I was just barely 13. Okay. So 13. So that's five-ish years. You go off to college. Yep. Johnson, absolutely. Vermont. Absolutely. Yeah. So what was it? You know, 
because you're starting at, at, at 13. That's a time when a lot of kids now, and, and you know this as, a, as an instructor, kids are kind of fading away from martial arts. Right, absolutely. Because of all the other sports, mm -hmm. their friends are there and everything. Yeah, yeah. So what was it that not only kept you there, but made it something you, you moved towards, you know, even picking up a new instructor? Right, right. Well, you know, as I finished up my sports career in high school, uh, when I went to college, I was still involved as a soccer player. Uh, but, you know, what really made me get serious about my Taekwondo training was my soccer coach and I did not like each other very much. <laughs> and it was a blessing in disguise because, you know, I said, you know what, I'm never going to be a professional soccer player because uh, once college is done, that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to actually focus my time towards the martial arts. And I actually, with the guidance of Grandmaster Dunleavy, uh, we started a program, accredited course at Johnson State College, so the kids could train as an outside elective, sure. and they would actually get course credit for it. Wow. And so, so you know, that's what really made me get serious about the art, and uh, never looked back since then. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a good thing that I gave up the soccer, even though I had accomplished a ton. I got to play overseas in Europe and represent the United States, but I just knew that there was going to come to an end eventually and to you know make that choice but you know it, it was a painful choice i'll give you that at, at, sure. you know thinking about what i was really going to do but it was the best thing i ever did was that at all colored by your your relationship with your soccer coach well that actually spurred it okay. actually that was that was the thing that said you know what i'm out of here uh i've always been a person that is uh very individual I don't do what everybody does because everybody else does that. Sure. Uh, I was raised by my parents to be, you know, independent and to think for myself and be assertive and be strong. And I gained that knowledge, that type of attitude when I was very, very young. Uh, but because of the fact that I wasn't one of the, the soccer cronies, you know, that uh, we had to dress the same way and we had to go and eat together and we had to do right. this together. I was never one of those guys. And I refused to be one of those guys. though, so because I wasn't one of those guys, my coach and I didn't see eye to eye. He was one of those guys that was all about him, and you had to worship him, and you had to be like him, and uh, this wasn't my style. Never has been. So there's a little bit of a story there. Sure, sure. But I know you've got a lot more. Think about your best one, and why don't you share that with us? Oh, absolutely. I, my best one really is about a personal thing that happened to me. And it was, even though I had the program at Johnson State College, but my school in Underhill was not opened as of yet. Okay. And this story is the reason why I opened my school in Underhill. Okay. Okay. And it's, um, it's one of those things that uh, I hope inspires people. And uh, there's a lot to be learned from it. So basically what happened was in 1993, it was October 29th, 1993, at 8.04 a.m. I know that, I know that seems like, wow, oh, really? Her. That is specific. And here's why it's so specific. We all have these things that happen in our lives and that you will never forget. You'll never forget the day you, you, know, you were here when you know, the space shuttle catastrophe happened or when 911 happened yeah. or you remember the day you had you know, your first kiss, you know, whatever, all these different things you remember. But this one is ingrained in my brain. I'll never forget because at that particular time, I was on my way to work. And as I was driving, somebody fell asleep on the other lane in oncoming traffic, and we had a head-on car collision, mm. and I was almost killed. And uh, the jaws of life to open the car up to get me out, which is a god-awful sound. If you, if you never, ever want to have uh, a car being cut open a foot from your head. Sure. It is the worst yeah. thing ever. And when it happened... It was, I was going about 40 miles per hour. He was going 50. And he actually hit me head on. Uh, at least I think it was about 50. But I was driving a tiny little Ford Escort. Mm. No airbags. This was just the old passive lap belts and all yeah, those things. Yeah. And there was a skid mark 17 feet in the other direction from my car. So he hit me at a pretty good clip. So this car accident uh, happened. Now, at the time that it happened, um, I knew three guys on the rescue squad over here in Colchester, Vermont. And I happened to get in an accident that was literally a mile from the ambulance, from the station. So as I get, uh, as the accident happens, and I'm in severe pain, 
obviously. And the car was just a, destroyed like an accordion. Yeah. I looked down, and what had happened was I saw him coming at the last second, grabbed the steering wheel, tried to hit the brakes, and the impact happened right as I did that. So the entire right side of my body was just destroyed. Broken arm, radius and ulna, my foot and my leg. I looked down at my right foot, and I apologize, this might seem a little bit graphic, but my foot was completely turned upside down, but my leg was straight. And I was, I was a mess, and I wanted to get out of the car, and I couldn't. I, was just, I just didn't have the energy. Uh, thank goodness that I had already been training for quite some time now. And I was able to focus and kind of breathe through the whole thing. Yeah. And the gentleman that hit me wasn't even wearing a seatbelt. He got out of his car. He was fine. And he starts freaking out. My car, my car. And then he passes out. Okay, I'm like, wait a second. I'm the one over here that's a mess, right? Yeah. Well, the ambulance comes. Now, while the ambulance is on its way, there was a woman who came upon the scene. And... She says, are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm just in a lot of pain. Can you get me out of here? She's like, well, listen, I'm going to get in the seat behind you and I'm going to hold your head still. I'm a nurse, okay? And I, when the ambulance comes, I can hear them coming. So I, you know, I'm going to hold you still. I'm like, that's fine. So she gets in the seat behind me and she says, what's your name? And I said, Lenny Jordan. And she's like, where do you live? I said, Porter's Point Road in Colchester. And she says, well, what's your name? I said, you already asked me that. <laughs> and she was like, I'm fine. I'm just checking with you to make sure you're with it. I'm like, I'm absolutely with it, ma'am. I'm just in a lot of pain. You got to get me out of here. So she says, the ambulance is here. I'm going to let them take over. My friend Kevin on the, uh, on the, on the medics, he's like, Lenny, how you been? I'm like, uh, not too good. He goes, you had better days, huh? I'm like, uh, you think? So he says, hang in there. We'll get you out of here. So We'll fast forward, they get me out of there, bring me to the hospital, the whole gamut. And, you know, I was in a wheelchair for about a month and a half. And it was, it was really tough to deal with because at the time, my martial arts career, and this is how I'm going to tie this in a little bit, I'm going to keep kind of coming back and forth to this. But at the time when it happened, I was one of the guys on the circuit. Yeah, I was. And, you know, here I was, I was young, I was strong, and I was at my physical best. And I was doing okay for myself. Um, and uh, never won national championships, but regionally I was, I was doing okay. Uh, so fast forward to about a month down the road, they have a surprise party for me. They had me get out of the house. Somebody came and got me, wheelchair, the whole gamut, right? So they have us get together, and sure enough, Kevin, the guy who was on the ambulance squad, is there. So I said, Kevin, how you doing, man? And he goes, good, Lenny. Nice to see you here. And I said, well, doing a lot better. I said, thank you so much for your help. And he goes, yeah, not a problem. But I said, I have to ask you, who was the woman that was in the seat holding my head still? And uh, he says, what woman? I said, the one who was holding my head when you guys got there. And this guy is kind of a smart aleck. He's a, he's a joker. He goofs off all the time. And he goes, there was nobody in the car. I said, no, Kevin, don't mess me. Who was it? He goes, and he looks at me kind of like when a pondering serious state, unlike I've never seen him. He goes, Lenny, there was nobody in the car. I said, okay, well, I dismissed that. I said, well, thanks for being here. And I just dropped it and mm. I moved on. And I'm telling the story to uh, my dad, my, my birth dad, my dad. I have two dads, Master Rhoda, you right. know, stepdad, and my real dad in Texas. Yeah. So I'm talking to my real dad in Texas. And I told him the story. And he says to me, well, what did she look like? I said, I don't know. I couldn't see her. He goes, well, I said, I'm guessing maybe 50 years old. I can hear the voice. I, I picture glasses and like a curly silver hair. And he says to me, he goes, well, you just described your aunt who was a nurse who passed away while you were pregnant. <clears throat> so, you know, one of the things that's not going to come through because this is audio is the look that's on your face right now. And we're kind of in a, in a space that for a lot of people is really difficult to think about and difficult to accept or, you know, wherever you, you fall in terms of those Beliefs. beliefs absolutely absolutely but i have no doubt from seeing the impact it has on you with a story that i'm sure you've told quite a few times absolutely absolutely that happened 
20, I'm doing math. 20 years ago? Uh, 22 years ago. 22 years 90, ago. 93, yeah. So, you know, so it still yeah. has that impact on you. Absolutely. That happened. Absolutely. I have no doubt that yeah. that happened. <laughs> so, you know, and take it for what it will. You know, there's yeah. people out there who can say whatever they want to say. But the reason why I tell you this story, too, is because after all of this is said and done, I'm actually glad that it happened. And why I'm glad that it happened was because at the time in my life, I needed a serious paradigm shift. Hmm. At the time, it was I wanted to be the best martial artist. I wanted to have the cool car. I wanted to have the nice house. I wanted to make this amount of money. And typical 24-year-old. Sure. Right? Absolutely. And it happened. And I took it as a way of some things need to change. I was fortunate. I'm still here, which is good. Uh, <laughs> at least I think it is, right? Yeah. Uh, so at, at that point is when I really had a different mindset. And I had to recover for a long time. Yeah. But it told me, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to open a school, a full-time school in Andre Hill. Because I saw it as I'm not going to be the same competitor that I used to be. At least let me start to pass on some knowledge that was handed down to me from Grandmaster Dunleavy, who was not Grandmaster Dunleavy at the time, it was right. Master Dunleavy. Uh, hand down some knowledge and try to, you know, pass on what I've learned because I've learned a lot at an early part of my career. So that accident was the cause of me opening my school. Hmm. Um, every other story I have pales in comparison. I mean, there's some funny ones and there's some great ones. I'll, hopefully I could share some of them yeah, still. Yeah, we'll get uh, But that is what really made me have my school. And at that point, uh, my philosophy changed quite a bit. And my school philosophy that I came up with at that time, I said, if I'm going to have a school, this has to be it. And it's my school motto. We use it all the time. You know, and is we train to rise above ourselves, never to rise above other people. Hmm. Um, because before that it was like, I want to be, you know, the best of all, you know, right. and if you train just to overcome other people, there's only winning and losing. And at the end of the day, when you're retired, you become a coach. Yep. That's it. Yeah. So that is uh, the genesis of how I got that school started. That's, that's a good story. I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so our next question on the list, you certainly dug into quite a bit of it, mm -hmm. the question yeah. about how the martial arts has made you sure. better. Well, and, you know, and, and that is, you know, a lot better. But even deeper back when I was first started out, um, I had a furious temper as a kid. Really? Oh, man. I was even keeled and easygoing as anybody you're going to meet. Yeah. You know, but it took me a while to get there, obviously. Um, but I had a really bad temper, but there was a reason why I had a bad temper. And this is pretty deep stuff, too. Okay. Uh, we moved to Randolph, Vermont. <clears throat> in 1976, mm -hmm. and uh, for those of you who will be, you know, listening to this, and maybe there's a picture attached, right? You'll there see what I look like, right? Okay, cool. In case you've never met me, uh, I do not look like your typical rural farmer from Randolph, Vermont. Uh, you, you, you have darker <laughs> skin. Than I got you. a great tan. So, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, I'm Spanish. I have a Spanish heritage. Uh, when we moved to Vermont, there literally, I joke and I say, there was 3,000 flannel wearing farmers and me. <laughs> So keep not in mind. To, as someone who lived in Randolph, that's right. not far off. Right. So uh, keep in mind that 1976 uh, was only eight years after the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we opened up a restaurant. We were merchants in the town. Uh, but I literally swear on anything holy that I could walk down the street and people would roll by, roll their window down and yell a racial slur at me. And even the wrong one too. Right. Like, man, come on, get it right, you know. So, but so as a kid coming from Connecticut, where I'm originally from, you know, our next door neighbor, you know, we had Asian neighbors, we had Cuban neighbors, we had you know Jewish neighbors, we had Italian, and it was just a, that's how it was. Right. So to come up to a uh, little town, and and I'm not disparaging Randolph, Vermont. I love that place. It's got such fond memories for me. But back in the early '70s, it was tough for me to uh, to deal with certain things. Yeah. Uh, for it's like, why does this person dislike me? I didn't do anything to them. I didn't quite understand that as a kid. Uh, so I was pretty easily set off. And my mom had the foresight to say, there's a martial arts school that just opened. And she knew that martial arts done the right way can help someone control their emotions, focus their energy in a positive way. So 
she actually enrolled it, enrolled me. Mm. And it was the best thing that ever happened because it really did give me a certain inner peace and control. And it served me well in sports growing up. Uh, it served me well in all of my uh, personal and interpersonal relationships. Um, so it really helped define who I am as an individual. Now, here you are at 13. Mm -hmm. Jumping into the martial arts, right. it's a time that, that even if you don't have anger issues, yeah, most well, thirteen year old boys pretty <laughs> angry. You know, um, do you have any memories around not being angry? You know, oh, um, I do. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and are you referring to just life in general or no, no, martial no, arts? No, something or... where where you you know maybe it struck you to, set, to that you realized your reaction had changed a bit because of martial arts. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, it, I would say almost immediately. Really? Real, almost immediately. When I say immediately, you know, I'm old now, so, you know, <laughs> thinking back to those days. Uh, I'd say, you know, within six months, okay. I had noticed a difference. I really had. You know, I wasn't set off as easily. Uh, maybe part of it became as a young, you know, young teenager, now knowing that, you know, I've only been training for a little while, but man, I have a certain amount of self-confidence that comes along with that. And I was never a kid that lacked confidence, but a different kind of confidence that came through, you know, and it didn't bother me. Words were words, you know, and, and there's lots of different mitigating circumstances and you learn these things along the way uh, and different things you hear from uh, parents and other adult figures and teachers and friends. And, you know, you collect it all and try to remember as much as you can. And, uh, but I remember, you know, relatively short on in my career that I had a change of uh, attitude. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So we, uh, that first story, it's funny, if we, as we look through the <laughs> list of questions, that first mm -hmm. story encompassed so much of, of the, you know, yeah. maybe someday I'll publish it, the, the 12 questions that I, yeah, yeah. that I asked that I send everybody in yeah. advance. And the next one's about a low point in your life. Oh, yeah, that was... And we certainly dug into that. Yeah. But I'd like you to think about another one. Mm -hmm. Think about one where, you know, outside of that, be it, be it yeah. before or, sure. or maybe since. Sure. Well, let's... Um, I will think about my school when I, after I had opened it in Andre Hill. Okay. Uh, I came from a lot of old school... I'm, I'm the last generation of being on the receiving end of old school. I, I, I'm right there with it. <laughs> being it from your parents or even in the martial arts mm -hmm. or just in general. You know, as, as a young boy, I was taught, you say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And, and before I even did martial arts. So that was a piece of cake when it came to martial arts. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's something to be said about the old school way. So when I started my school... I felt that if the students didn't throw up after the workout, I didn't give them a good enough workout. It was, it was insane. Uh, but look what happened. Fred Forsberg, you know, his sister Mickey, uh, Shelby and Brianne Williamson, and all these masters that came out from that generation. Um, and then, so I pushed them really, really hard. And the day I opened my school, the very day I opened my school, I had 33 students. Where did they come from? all in Underhill and Jericho. Okay. I was already known in the community okay. uh, as a soccer coach. and had, I used to be a uh, disc jockey. I used to DJ weddings. I used to manage Vermont's largest company. So people knew who I was. Okay. And I was also into the martial arts already, so I competed a lot. So, you know, Vermont's only so big. Right. And Chittenden County, even though it's the biggest county, is still only so big. Right. Um, so when I opened my doors, I had 33 students, and I pushed them really, really hard. And suddenly I found myself with only seven students. Ooh. They were seven hardcore, amazing students. But I was faced with, I'm gonna have to close my school. Yeah. I can't, you know, I had another job, nine to five, but it didn't seem worth it to me. And I had to do some real soul searching. And I, I really had to think about where I was going with this. And yeah, I almost, almost called it quits. I almost just wrapped it up and said, you know what, I gave it a whirl. But that's not my style, yeah. and I wasn't raised that way. So I had to reinvent myself, change how I my approach, and figure out, you know, once you figure out what it is that you want to be, then, you know, set a course and stick to it. Yeah. You know, if that's not perseverance and an animal spirit, I don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> uh, so I had to change my philosophy and try to figure out a way to motivate and instill passion about the martial arts without having to physically beat them down and say yes sir and you know that's the stuff that we 
knew of. Mm-hmm. You know, when we started martial arts, when I started back in 82, there was no kids. It was guys who watched too many martial arts movies and liked to go to bars. And, oh, I'm a karate guy, and I'm going to get in a bar fight. And it was just like, that's who I was surrounded by. Because uh, that's what we saw in the movies. Yeah. You know, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and all those guys, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was pretty painful, the fact that I was getting ready to close my school. And I, I just didn't want to do that. Why? Um, because I had something to say. I knew what I wanted to be when I first started, but I didn't know how to get there. What, I, what did you want to be? Well, I, first of all, I looked at the old school masters. Mm-hmm. I wanted their knowledge. I wanted their expertise. I wanted their um, the honor of being a position in the community to help forge individuals okay. and to create an environment that was positive. I just didn't know how to get there. Uh, I knew what I didn't want to be, and you and I both know some of the old school masters that were, you know, some of them are no longer with us, uh, amazing martial arts practitioners. The knowledge, they have, they have forgotten more than I will ever know, right? And I wanted all that information. But as a white belt, as a beginner, I wasn't even allowed to say hi to them. Yeah. And I wasn't raised that way. I was very respectful and, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, and um, I just kept on pestering them. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Finally, they, how are you doing? Yeah. You know? So I wanted to be like them. But I just didn't know how to get there. Sure. Um, but that whole school closing thing, you know, that happened again at my second location here in Burlington. I almost shut the doors. For and the same reason? For the same reason. What happened was, I have, you know, in, in Burlington, uh, rent is just outlandish. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. $12 a square foot type of thing. It's just, you can't afford it. Uh, so I opened a school in Burlington thinking about, well, there's not too many martial arts schools right here where I want to do this. But I'm not competing against martial arts schools in Burlington. You're competing against the waterfront. You're competing against the mall. You're competing against kids camps. You're competing against everything that's in Chittenden County to do. And I just didn't realize that. Yeah. I had to leverage my house to pay off the lease. So I was like, that's it. I can't do this anymore. And fortunately, I got a break where I was told to come in and do a demonstration at our school. And so I did a demonstration at a local public school, which is where my daughter goes to school, private school, actually. And uh, from that, I got eight students immediately. Mm. And I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> and the rest is history. I looked up from there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so twice I, I almost uh, threw in the towel. Yeah. It's certainly a lot of dedication, dedication to your sure. students. And, you know, when I asked you some of those questions there, and I think it lets us listening to you connect those dots. Mm-hmm. Because we've all had that, that spot, you know, often it's tied to, to money. Yeah. And it's usually about money, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, and you look at it and you're going, how am I going to get from A to B? Yeah. And it takes something solid, something strong, pushing you, pulling you, whatever the motivation is mm-hmm. to get to that. And I don't regret any of them either. That, all the, even the negative things, you know, they help define who you are as an individual. Sure. You know, and you learn, oh, well, I won't do that again, <laughs> or I won't put up with this again. Um, but as long as you uh, keep on moving in the right direction, then, you know, you're on to something there. So you mentioned those those seven students that stuck around after the 33. Oh, yeah. Do you still have any of those? Uh, I have actively training. Yeah. Two. Cool. Yes. That's fun. Yeah. And there's some that came in just after that. I still consider part of the original crew because they were there, you know, within months after sure. my school opening. Absolutely. So we have a pretty good retention. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So you've really only met, you've mentioned two of your instructors, Mm -hmm. you know, Grandmaster Dunleavy and and, and Master Twing. Yeah. So let's take them out of the mix. Okay. Who would you say was the most instrumental in getting, not just getting you into the martial arts, but keeping you in the martial arts and, and making you the martial artist that you are today? You know, outside of my immediate instructors, um, I have to give you know props to my parents, obviously, okay. you know for um, them, as, as I mentioned previously, having the uh, you know the foresight yeah. to, to put me into the martial arts. And, and you said they train too. They train absolutely, okay. absolutely, and um, you know we're all masters and, and uh, uh, you know, stuck it out since then. Right. Uh, but if it wasn't for them, you know, obviously once you get there, then the instructors take over. But you know their support and their guidance. Uh, as my parents and to keep pushing me and 
trying to, you know, Lenny, be the best you can be at no matter what you do. I don't care what it is, but just work hard at it. And let the chips fall where they may. Sure. You know, uh, so you know those life lessons. Um, I'd say those guys outside of my instructor. Yeah. So competition. We talked a bit about yeah competition yeah. prior yeah. to yeah. that car accident. Tell tell us about that. Why did you? Well, I'm just, you didn't say you enjoyed it, but I'm going to assume if you were doing it that much, you enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh man, I had I had a. I say had because you know here I'm 46 years old, but for, for all intents and purposes, I'm I'm long com, you know long from competition. Just because uh, that's not my mindset. Do I still have the ability? Absolutely, but I don't have the desire to do that. Um, but when I competed, um, I competed hard. I competed 12 times, 15 times a year. Um, I competed a lot. I sparred a lot. I did a lot of patterns. Um, my favorite was always patterns over sparring, even wow. though I excelled at sparring. Um, again, you know, it's always weird to talk about yourself in, in terms of, uh, of your accolades. Sure. Um, but for what it is, you know, I sparred hundreds and hundreds of matches, and I only lost two in my career. Okay. So I'm pretty happy about that career. So, um, that, so that's pretty impressive. What was it about patterns, forms, yeah. kata... Yeah. say yeah whichever you're, you're yeah, whatever call all the tall. different people uh, yeah yeah at some point I'll have yeah. to you know have to make a list of the every word pattern sure sure um, what was it you liked about that more why I enjoy patterns so much is well there's a variety of reasons I don't want to say is because there's a variety uh, it encompasses everything you've learned since day one of walking into the studio everything you learn has to come out in that one moment. Also, it is the one thing you cannot luck your way through. <laughs> you can get lucky sparring. We've all, like, someone's coming at you and you just, you turn and you throw your hand and hope for the best and you hit them right in the head. Woohoo, point for me. Doesn't make me a phenomenal fighter, okay? You cannot luck your way through a pattern. You have to continually practice, practice, practice. The dedication. Um, because, after all, that is the art side of the martial arts without patterns we're just fighting and does that make you a martial artist i can i can take the next person walking by right now off the street say come here pick your foot up throw a front kick Woohoo! you can do it does that make them a martial artist absolutely not the patterns encompass everything you are the holistic approach from the you know the tenants from the points of power to you know realism to uh, your heart and soul. When you finish your pattern, be it open hand or even with a weapon, which is just an extension of yourself, mm -hmm. you got to pour, pour your heart and soul into that. And every single nuance matters. You are accountable for every single movement. There is nothing that should happen that doesn't have a purpose in it. So the constant work and dedication to that, to excel at that, I'm sorry, in my personal opinion, people may differ, and that's, that's what makes us beautiful as people. We have different opinions. Um, it is much more important than the ability to just be a good fighter because it wraps it all up in one whole. But, you know, in terms of the competition, though, uh, I won a lot of competitions regionally, national, you know, regionally, locally, and that stuff. But uh, after my car accident, a year and a half exactly to date, is when I finally won national championships. And I wasn't even half the martial arts I was before my car accident. Huh. And I won, you know, men's black belt heavyweight fighting. And heavyweight, I know, I'm only 5'8", but, you know, I'm also, you know, short and stocky, you know? Uh, so I think the cutoff was like 185 or something like that. It was lightweight and heavyweight. So I ended up being in heavyweight division, fighting guys that were, you know, 6'9", I mean, just <laughs> giant individuals. Uh, but you know, it was, it was because, you know, here I am half the martial artist I was physically. Um, but I was training for the right reasons just to be the best person that I could be and just be the best technician that I could be. And if you did it for the right reasons, let the chips fall where they may. And, uh, you know, uh, my instructor, Grandmaster Dunleavy is phenomenal. <laughs> so his knowledge that he passed to me, I was able to use, but I just found it rather ironic that here I was setting out to be a champion, got crushed in a car accident, 
half the martial artists physically, and then I win. And I had failed that winning prior to the car accident. Hmm. <laughs> so I enjoy that. Do you really think you were half the martial artist? Physically, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's like there's days where I get up and I, I can't walk for 10 minutes because of my foot and the surgery. Three surgeries make it look like a foot again. And the, the metatarsals are fused together. Uh, I just, you know, I, I couldn't move as fast as I used to. Um, and, you know, in martial arts and Taekwondo, your legs are everything, man. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so if it hurts to just, you know, jump around, yeah, it kind of limits what you can do. Uh, but, you know, you find a way. Yeah, yeah. that's, again, that, that A to B. Yeah, absolutely. Get, getting from, from one to the other. If you could train with anybody, mm -hmm. living, dead, who would it be? Um, boy, the obvious would be General Choi, General Che, if you pronounce it, actually, uh, since he's the man uh, responsible for spearheading the Taekwondo movement, you know, and coming up with the patterns in 1955, uh, even though it, it was around, you know, Taekwondo wasn't called Taekwondo, and for those who were history buffs, you know, you could research all this as to how it came to be, right. um, but you know, just because, you know, he's the man that made the patterns. Some would call him kind of the, the father, of, father of, of, of modern Taekwondo. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, that would be an obvious one just because it'd be cool to have some of his knowledge mm -hmm. and, you know, see where he was coming from when he designed all of this. Uh, why. Yeah. Yeah. See, why did you put a twin forearm block in the second pattern and it drives all the beginners nuts? You know, it's, I would love to ask right. him that, you know, right. but uh, he might hit me in an old school way and say, don't ask me that because I said so. <laughs> Remember the days? Grandmaster, because I said so. Yes. Why is your arm bent this angle? Because I said so. <laughs> I just want to know. Um, so he would be one. Another one would be probably uh, Jun Ri. Okay. Just because he was the first person to teach Taekwondo in the United States. Yeah. I believe it was 1962. Uh, if I'm, I, can't remember, I think that's the date. But, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I just, you know, the guy's still impressive. You can do 100 push ups in 60 seconds. Still. Yeah. And he's, well, he's got to be close to 70, right? Yeah, Keep going. Or is it more than that? Yeah. Keep going. I think I I yeah. want to say he's like 85, 87. Okay. I remember seeing him not too long ago, just just doing knuckle push ups. He did yeah. 100 of them in, in, in a minute. Yeah. And then he got bored and started to do some one handed ones after that. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But his Taekwondo knowledge, fantastic. Right. You know, the father of Taekwondo in the United States. So I'd say those two would be the ones that I would be you know, more apt to want to train with. Okay. Those are great answers. I mean, we've, I think we've had General Cho mentioned. Once or twice. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody said Jun Ri. Yeah. yeah. You a movie guy at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Any, I knew the answer to that. Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, so you know, I'm sure you've got some, some good martial arts films. That oh, yeah. I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy uh, you know, the cinematic masterpieces such as Crouching Tiger. Or even some of those old Sunday schlocky B-rated martial arts movies where the dubbing is all off. You know, I, I enjoy them all. Uh, but I'm kind of torn between my favorite. I'll, I'll mention two. Okay. Enter the Dragon, just because, yeah. you know, it's just such a complete martial arts movie. Just absolutely fantastic. And the other one being um, Jet Li's uh, Fist of Legend. Mm. Uh, just because of the sheer prowess that that guy has. And, and he's the real deal. He, this, there's no movie magic here. No. This, that man is the real deal. Of course, so was Bruce Lee. Right. Uh, but those two movies are, you know, two of my favorites. Uh, I'd say for more realistic effect, look at Best of the Best. Yeah. You know, the uh, USA team versus Korea team. And that's kind of how the matches were back in, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so, you know, that's another one of my favorites, even though there's some pretty bad acting in it. Sure. Of course, and speaking about the martial arts movie, that kind of ties us into your favorite martial arts actor. Right. right. Yeah, which would be Jet Li for me. Okay. Just, you know, he's a, I guess in real life, I don't, I you only hear certain things about him yeah. that uh, he's actually a monk and he's actually a pretty humble, quiet guy. Really? Yeah. That, and that, that he means. actually had contemplating uh, retiring from the movie scene in itself. That I did hear. Yeah. That. And I think partially it was because of his personal beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, just watching that guy do his stuff, it's so fluid. And of course, you know, you see him pull off four kicks in midair before you land, right? Right. Which is impressive. You know, I used to be able to do a few, uh, but I would love to see a guy who's 6'5", 250 pull that off. That's more impressive. Yeah. You don't see that. So it's easier when you're smaller. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he's, he's great. And, you know, you can always tell 
the good martial artists because their fight scenes don't have to be edited. No. Yeah. You know, it's a wider shot. Mm -hmm. It's a consecutive shot. They're not chopping it up and editing it, editing it together to make it look good. Mm -hmm. Um, and the technique is beautiful. As a martial arts, watching a martial artist movie, uh, you can say, oh, that was legit. That right. was perfect. Right. And then we see stuff that's movie magic, and you just kind of chuckle a little bit. Like, it's like, yeah, not on your best day. <laughs> Did you see Forbidden Kingdom with Tim and Jackie Chan? Uh, no, I have not. That that There's really only one solid fight scene in there between the two of them. Right. It's, unfortunately, it's too far towards the end. Okay. But I sat there, the, the whole movie kind of bouncing in the theater and in the seat, just... When are they going to fight? When are they going to fight? And it was worth it. It was absolutely. I'll it check was it out. Fight scene. Very cool. For sure. Are you a reader at all? Any, um, any books? A little bit. You know, um, in terms of martial arts books, I probably would say uh, Art of War or Zen in the Martial Arts. Okay. Um, probably more partial to Art of War. Uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, just, I, I love the tactics and strategy behind, you know, what he discusses. Um, and it, how it can be applied to actually our modern day sparring. Absolutely. Um, I remember reading somewhere in, I believe it was The Art of War, where he spoke about the individual as themselves and how they need to be. And I was completely shocked how close it was to my school motto. Mm-hmm. And that kind of made me feel like, I mean, I'm on the right track here. You know, so I, I didn't read that first and then come up with my motto. My motto came up with something that meant something to me. But when I saw it in an excerpt from Sun Tzu, one of his writings, I was like, wow, that's that's cool. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm in good company there. I like Absolutely. that. Yeah. And Zen and the Martial Arts. I mean, I haven't bumped into a lot of people that have read that. But yeah. that, yeah. Um, when I started training in the Martial Arts, my mom started not too long after. Mm-hmm. And so that was a book that um, was in the bathroom. Yeah. And standard reading. Yeah. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I've read through that sure. that sure. book and just yeah. was pretty foundational for me. Awesome. Awesome. It's nice and short. Anybody that hasn't checked it out. Yeah, absolutely. Little, little bits. I mean, it's, it's a relatively easy read. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a lot going on. You've done a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But obviously, you know, we've we've got that that theme running here through the, the A to B, you know, moving forward. So yeah. what's what's moving you forward now? What do you what are your goals? Um well the immediate goal, which isn't so immediate, is to be a grandmaster. Okay. And in Taekwondo, that comes at eighth dawn. Mm-hmm. So uh, here I am at sixth dawn, and uh, you know I'll, I'll get there. I guarantee that. Um, I will not stop doing this as long as I'm on this earth. Uh, so, so that's the immediate, uh, easiest goal to achieve. Uh, to achieve, I think. Why? Um, I guess because you know you want to get to the point of where uh, if I get to that point then it's a mark of a life's accomplishments. It's a mark of, of dedication and all that you've done for the martial arts community. Because you don't get to that rank without bringing something to the martial arts community. You don't just train at a school and become an eighth don or a ninth don. That is reserved for the people who are uh, moving martial arts forward in a positive direction, helping the martial arts to evolve, um, and fostering a, a positive environment for people to grow in and build stronger families and individuals. So for me personally to get to that, that means I have achieved those type of things. And that'll be my legacy. Okay. Yeah. And that's a goal that, as we were talking about you in your 20s, mm-hmm. I mean, it was pretty clear that, I mean, that's the description. Absolutely. You know, yeah, use that as as I didn't say specifically grandmaster, but, but it's pretty clear that that's where I wanted to be. Yeah, absolutely, what I wanted to be. You know, so you haven't wavered from that, so that's great. No, no, and I never will. I never will. And in terms of um, you know what else keeps me going, um, I love to live vicariously through my students. I love seeing them succeed, not just in the martial arts. I have had so many students start as children, grow up, go away to college. And say in their entry uh, essay, they write to the colleges for their, you know, please take me to your school. And they write about becoming a black belt at my school Mm. and what it took to get there. I am darn proud of what it takes to become a black belt at my school. And we hold all of our students to a higher level 
not based on their athleticism, not based on whether they can throw a straight up side kick or not. It's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with who they are as a person from day one until the day they get that black belt. How have they grown? How have they uh, changed as a person? And I get so many uh, stories and feedback from all these kids who've grown up, got black belts, gone off to school. And that is beautiful to see. I love watching my current list of black belts grow. And uh, we just had a testing not too long ago where we were able to promote, you know, a bunch of people to fifth on and one to fourth on. And that doesn't happen every day. Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, we have more masters at my school than a lot of schools in this immediate smaller school in this area have black belt. Right. We have a really, really excellent black belt crew at our school. And I just can't get rid of them. I try, but I can't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do to make them quit? Nah, I keep trying, but they just keep coming back, you know. Before I came up here today, I was editing an episode that we recorded with one of your students. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be episode 14 with mm -hmm. Master Fred Forsberg. Oh, cool. Yeah. And he told a story about you pulling him aside on a Friday as a, I think he was a, a late teen, 16, 17 year old kid saying, you're taking class on Monday. And just now, you know, 10 years later, how strong of an impact that was for him mm -hmm. and, and i think it um it's a great example of what you're talking about with that personal growth sure sure you know because you can listen to it anyway if, if you've listened to if you're listening to this episode and you haven't listened to that one and you know i think you should listen to all of them yeah absolutely you know go back listen to that one yeah. uh because it's so clear that even though on the surface it sounds like something that's simple and something that all of us might expect it's clear that him stepping up even for that one night to run class yeah. to run class was huge. And, and he talks about the emotion and, and the almost the terror, you know, was, <laughs> was he capable of doing this? Sure. And, and he and I talked a little bit about, you know, clearly you knew he could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that growth process, yeah. and it's something that I think we have in martial arts that you don't have elsewhere. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love to say about martial arts is you get back exactly what you put in. And there aren't a whole lot of things on earth that are like that. Right, right. Of course, yeah, I like watching my students rise to the level of expectation. Yeah. You know, I really do. Um, so, you know, those guys keep me going and keep me on my toes. Um, I love if somebody asks me a question and I'm not fully sure of the answer. Mm. Because that says, you know what, Let me. I'll tell you what. I'm not going to give you an answer that I'm not quite sure of. I said, let me discuss this with Grandmaster Dunleavy and will, I'll give you the appropriate answer. It doesn't happen very often by any means. Right. Um, just because, you know, I've been doing this longer than any of my students. Right. Um, and I've heard every possible question you can come up with and I have answers ready. Um, but some answers change throughout the time as well, too. But if it happens, you know, I'm, I am man enough to say, you know what? Let me get back to you on that one. You know, and that quest for knowledge. There's always a quest for knowledge. And if you stop trying to gain that knowledge, then you're just going to be antiquated and you're going to move backwards. Yeah. Yeah. There's not only is there nothing wrong with not having an answer. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. if you're, if you constantly know the answers to all the questions, you're not asking the right questions. Sure. There you go. Yeah. Cause how do you move forward unless you're yeah. questioning everything? Yeah. So not that you haven't given bucket loads of it, but do you have any advice that you'd like to give everybody listening? Yeah. You know, um, for me, if I can tell anybody who's training in the martial arts, first of all, ask why are you training in the martial arts? And as long as your answer is a healthy reason, then that's good. But you need to train for the right reason. You need to train to overcome your own weaknesses. You need to be a better person than you were yesterday. Um, again, if you ever shift to the attitude of I am training because I want to be the best fighter. I want to be the champion. Uh, now your focus is about overcoming other people. You need to constantly just look at yourself every single day and say, was I better? Am I better today than what I was yesterday? Uh, train for the right reasons. That was always taught to be by Grandmaster Donnelly. And in our association, that is the attitude you must have to thrive in our schools. I personally do not care how many medals you win. 
I personally do not care if you can do a perfect split. I personally do not care if people are afraid of you. I care about the individual becoming a better person. Because what I tell my students is, look, if you are a better person, that makes your family stronger. If your family is stronger, that makes your community stronger. If your community is stronger, then you are affecting people all over the place. So you need to understand where it really matters as you being the best you that can be. And I'm not telling you anything that I don't tell my own daughter. I tell my daughter about being the best person that you can be. And she was upset because she didn't get straight A's. She got a B. She's a really good student. She was upset that she got a B. And I looked her right in the eye and said, Angelina, I said, you know what? That doesn't measure. That doesn't measure the kind of girl that you are. Mm. It doesn't measure how good of a friend you are. It doesn't measure how good of a daughter you are. It doesn't measure how good of a teammate you are. That just measured how many things you were able to memorize about whatever the topic was. So, so don't get caught up in that, okay? Be the best person that you can be. And that's how you end up paying things forward because you make somebody else better by being that way too. Well, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, buckets, yeah. buckets of advice here. I didn't give you any funny stories though. That's the thing. I have so many funny stories, but you know, yeah, it is what it is. You want to throw one out? Uh, let's see. One? Yeah, I'll, I'll let... Uh, let's see. Well, been a lot of intensity. Well, with, how about with, with this episode? How about I made somebody cry one time by doing a self defense seminar? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it on them. They were just watching. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, this woman. She was a very sensitive woman, very sweet, and she had just joined a school where I was as a guest instructor doing a martial arts seminar. And of course, uh, Master Forsberg was the guy that was, he was my, my demonstration person. And uh, for those of you who know him, he's a pretty strong kid. Um, so here I was doing a lot of Hapkido, joint lock, self-defense movements and incorporating uh, into the basic block strike thing. Yeah. And at the end of the seminar, she came up to me and she's like, I don't like you. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, did I say something? I'm, I'm sorry, is everything okay? You're mean to him. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no, he's fine. Trust me. <laughs> you gotta try. So I do it just enough, and he's a good, okay, he can fall. Well. I, he's not hurt, hon. Go talk to him. You'll see. And as I saw her now and again, she'd be like, hi, Master Jordan. And by the time she trained for her black belt, I was actually afraid of her. <laughs> she, she is intense. And it was funny because I brought it up at her testing how – there she was in tears when I was doing a simple wrist lock takedown about how mean I was. And then I saw what she did at her testing and she remembered the conversation and she started giggling. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no need to be sorry. It's just fantastic to see what you've become. And now as a black belt, you understand what we were doing. Yeah. You know? Um, and then uh, another quick one for gross out factor. Sure. Hey. <laughs> uh, Master Rhoda, uh, who is a, not a very big individual. You know, he's what, 5'7", yeah. uh, maybe 165 pounds, you know, kind of unassuming. But growing up, I like to call country strong. <laughs> his family was a bunch of loggers, right? He, he just he just, talks frequently just, in class about his time in the woods. Just country strong, you know. Uh, to the kind of part where he was trying to lift a boulder and it into a wheelbarrow. And this was probably a good 275 pound trying to get it into her. And he kept trying and it fell onto his foot out of the wheelbarrow. And he got mad. And I saw him bend down and pick it up and just curl it and walk around the house and throw it in the ditch. And at that point, I'm thinking, I'm going to go clean my room. You know, <laughs> so Master Rhoda, as intense as he was, uh, he actually used to do a board breaking competition. <clears throat> and if you people listening know what an in-step turning kick is, uh, using the top of your foot to hit boards, and it's, it stings. Round kick. Or round, roundhouse, roundhouse kick, kick yep. yep. Uh, so he did six boards, a six-board turning kick, and he would grab those boards together, and he never used those nice kiln dry. He used rough-cut lumber. It was, I mean, still dripping sap. It's no just, spacers. No spacers. No, this was just a chunk of wood. So he'd go to the tournaments, and then he'd step up, and everybody would be like, oh, come on, because they knew it was coming. Bam, first shot. Put the boards down, stay there, bow, walk away, gold medal, tournament after tournament. We were at a tournament in Chelsea one day, and he decides to boost board break. And the whole gym is just packed, and they see him coming, so it literally got quiet. 
and he lines up. He's like, ah, and whap, and he hits it as hard as he can with the top of his foot. And all you hear is that sound of bone and flesh on boards. It didn't break. And the whole crowd is just like, oh, you see people just visually disturbed. <laughs> and he says, huh, and he goes a second time, whap. Again, same noise of bone crunching, you know, just, and the whole crowd now is just skin crawling, you know, nails on a chalkboard feeling. Yeah. And he says, ah, he goes for a third time. And he hauls off and he hits it as hard as he can. The minute he hits it, the board just turns red. Oh. And the top of his foot just blew open. And at that point, people are losing their mind. But he's so, he was just like, so matter of fact about it, he just grabs the boards, looks at the judges and says, well, guess it's not going today. And walks off the floor. <laughs> and people were just beside themselves, you know, and didn't win a medal. But man, put the fear of God in a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we... Uh, Someday, I encourage all the people who are listening to this who may be beginners in martial arts, stick with this because there's going to come a time where you get to sit around and chat with all the instructors and the masters, be it at a summer camp or a dinner after a tournament, and you get to hear some amazing stories. Yeah. And the stories that just build character uh, that about friendship, uh, laughter, sadness, pain, joy, and take it all in. Sure. Because those, those stories, if they're not told, they're going to be long gone. Right. And there are plenty of stories, you know, I mean, part of the goals of this podcast is to capture as many of them as we can, yeah. but there are plenty that people are never going to want to go on record telling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. I appreciate it. Yeah. So let's let's flip it now. You know, what, what do you have going on that you want to share with people? Well, we, uh, you know, the one thing that we, we host every year is our fall tournament. You know, that's coming up the first weekend of November. That's yep. uh, usually up here in Jericho, Vermont at Mount Mansfield High School. And it's one of the larger tournaments up in this area. It is an open tournament, even though there's not a ton of karate schools up here in the northern part of Vermont. Yeah. You know, I'd say probably 25, 30% of the people that compete are karate schools. Yep. Uh, a couple others, you know, maybe some Chinese styles as well also, but predominantly Taekwondo schools in the area. Uh, this is going to be our 17th year of hosting that tournament. Um, and that's about the only thing we have going on. We do have some inter-school stuff, be it summer camps, and uh, we do a fundraiser every year, Kickathon. We raise money for the Vermont Respite House, and we'll be doing that again this year. And in the past years that we've done that for the Vermont Respite House, we've raised, I think, over $15,000 for them. Right. Um, and that's where my wife's father spent the last two weeks of his days with us. Oh, okay. So we're forever tied to them because those guys are angels on earth. Vermont Respite House is just incredible for people who do that type of service yeah. that provide that end of life care and just so selflessly and beautifully. Um, it's a good thing. So we, we give our money and we help out for that every single year. Okay. Uh, so that's pretty much what's going on in terms of events for us. Okay. Yeah. And of course, there's your website and your yeah. Facebook page. And Absolutely. We'll links to that. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and as soon as the tournament information is up, we'll, sure. we'll get that out there. Yeah. And, does the Kickathon get anything on your website that we can uh, link to? Yeah, what I'll do is I will be posting that more, probably uh, on both sites, uh, our, our web page and our Facebook page as well also. And, you know, the students do a great job of raising money for that. Yeah. And just to keep it in context real quickly, we started out doing a 1,000 kicks in a half an hour. Yeah. And that was a piece of cake. Yeah. We literally did that in, like, nothing. Right. So let's amp it up. Let's go 1,500 kicks in a half an hour. No problem. Wrote the record, 30 minutes, no problem. Then we went, okay, let's do it in less time. And then we did it in 26 minutes. And then we did it in 20 minutes. And then let's amp them. Let's go to 2,000 kicks. So now we 2,000 kicks. We did that in 30 minutes. And then it was 2,000 kicks in 25 minutes. And then let's just amp it up. So last year, the last one we did was 2,500 kicks. And we did, and then we're not talking everybody, everybody individually does 2,500 kicks. We're not talking you do 100, you do 100, you do, no. Okay. Every single person does 2,500 kicks. That's a lot of kicks. Oh, absolutely. And we ended up doing it in 26 minutes. That's a, it was, ended up being like a kick every 0.9 seconds. Wow. Oh, it's absolutely insanity. But the way that the team comes together... And That's the, the slow person. What's that? Oh, yeah. The slowest <laughs> person is doing it in 0.9 seconds. You know, that if you average it out, that amount of kicks over that and do the math, yeah. it ends up being that. And some people get them done faster. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, some, you know, and there's, we have all ages. We had you know, seven-year-olds doing this. And we had 60-year-olds doing this. And obviously, you do what you can do. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have some that 
probably pull off more kicks than what we're asking. And we, maybe there's a couple kids who didn't quite get all of them, but the goal is that, and the music's going, and people are cheering, and we're having a great time, and uh, it really is one of those things that these people will look back years from now, and they'll never, ever forget what they went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. I don't think there's much else to say. I appreciate you coming on. This is absolute, fun. Absolute pleasure. Um, I'm honored to be part of this. And there's a lot of incredible martial artists that we have up here in New England. Yeah. You don't have to travel across the country to meet some of the exceptional people that we have in our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm one of those people that I love being friends with all of them. Yeah. And hopes that someday, you know, we all unite as a Vermont martial arts type of thing, you know. Yeah, that'd be fun. So that's been my dream from the get-go. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode 18 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to Master Jordan for his time and his wonderful stories. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. If you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a big difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do read yours on the air, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and more. We'll even pay the shipping. You can check out the show notes with links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show, or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on everything Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. While you're at it, check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. From gear to shirts to pants to a whole bunch more, it's all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.